Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dark Rhino Security, Security Confidential. And today we have a very special guest, Jack Scott. She is a cyber influencer. She's an author. She's a speaker, a podcaster. She hosts the podcast Two Cyber Chicks. So another podcaster talking to another one. This should be interesting. Uh, she has over 13 years of experience in IT, in cyber both private and public sectors. She spent a significant portion of her life serving in the Special Operations Command, spearheading global cyber electronic war warfare and intelligence operations. She is also the president and founder for Outpost Gray. I don't know where you get the time to do all that, Jax, but welcome to the show. Thank you. Manash, I'm happy to be here. It's awesome. I, we've been trying to make this happen for, I feel like, months now. And there's been like rescheduling. So I'm thrilled to be here. And I obviously, we're going to be talking about a topic I enjoy, cybersecurity. So it's going to be a good yeah, time. Yeah, you're... Um... You know, we, we've had the pleasure of seeing you on TV and, and we're honored to have a, a celebrity personality here. So that, I think that's, that's going a little far, celebrity, but I do appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, you know what? In cybersecurity, we don't have that many celebrities. So we're going to take what we can get here. I think that's because we're a lot of us are introverts. I'm actually introverted and we're like, no, don't really want to be in the spotlight. Um, but yeah, well, we... speaking of introverted, I would never believe that, but you made a statement that, that might break the shell a little bit here. And, and I got to ask it, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, I believe what you had said in the research we had done was what makes you special as a cyber operations soldier doesn't make you successful as a civilian woman. What does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. And yeah, when I was talking about that, like that, that came out of talking about being in the special forces and being a woman operator in that space. And just to kind of paint a picture, that's a very male dominated space. Cybersecurity is sure. male dominated, but it's kind of a different male dominated. These are males that are trained to be killing machines. Uh, when I was working with them, I mean, we're de deploying into austere and very kinetic, so very uh, like we're getting shot at environment kinetic. And you have a different mindset. It's a different, even though we're at the forefront and we're fighting a war within cybersecurity, it's very different when bullets are flying at you. And so the oh, mentality sure. that you take on in that space as a woman is you have to shed in a lot of ways the things that make you so unique as a woman, which is having empathy, being emotional. You can't be crying in combat when you see your buddy die. You have to be very mission oriented oh and, and you just, you shed all of that. Empathy will get you killed in a lot of ways. So what made me an extremely effective special operator within that space, when I came to the civilian sector and I had my ver first corporate America job in 2019, it was very challenging for me. I didn't even really connect with the males in the, sp in the space, much less the women, because I was what you would call like aggressive, but I wasn't, I wasn't cussing. I knew better. Like I had worked in the civilian space for long enough. I had just not worked in corporate America. So I knew, you know, having proper English was key, having good communication skills. But what made me different is I was I was very aggressive, very mission first, very mission focused. I didn't have empathy. I didn't lead as a leader with empathy. I didn't have really any true emotions. And once I started to learn, like, that's actually our superpower as women. Yes, all women listening out there, it is okay to have empathy and be emotional. It is a superpower. I think that's what makes you and I so wow. unique. I started to realize, oh my gosh, I can actually be myself, but I have to, in a way, shed who I was and what made me successful as an operator in that space and almost in a way become a new refined me, not lose me, just learn how to become a new refined version of Jax to be successful within the civilian space. You know what? That's, that's absolutely incredible. And it's very powerful that you're willing to embrace both sides. And I didn't realize you were in kinetic situations at, at the time in special operations, women were allowed in frontline combat positions. So what's unique about the role, and a lot of people don't know about this, uh, this program that was developed is the Cultural Support Team Program, and it was actually established by McChrystal in 2010 because we had an information gap in Afghanistan, and the pr reason why is the male operators were unable to talk to half the population, which were the sure. women and the children. Due to cultural and religious norms, unless they were directly related to those women and children, you were not allowed to speak to those 
women. So we had a massive information gap. And so they established this program that was the cultural support team program. And the idea was to train up when women send us through a physical assessment and selection, psychological evaluations. It was basically similar to what the males went through, but in a shorter period of time, then we went through cultural okay. training. And then what happened is that we went out as two man teams. So it was myself and another CST and typically an interpreter a U.S. citizen that spoke the language, we deployed and then we embedded and attached onto these teams where we would literally live in the villages. And there were times where I was on a compound and there was 12 people and I was the single woman. And I was with a, a group, it was called an ODA. And I worked with this element and I helped bridge that gap and get that get the information off of the women and children to help close the information gap. And yeah, during that time, I worked village level, I worked at the government level, and then I was afforded an opportunity to go onto a direct action team where then I did strictly connect, kinetic operations where we would embed at night, we would do our operations. And there was a many of times that we were surprised. Well, we didn't really surprise them. They were actually expecting us because somehow the information got out and a, a, it was supposed to be a very short operation turned into a 24 wow. hour operation where we're like bedded down, running out of supplies and just getting shot at for 12 hours. It was, it's a wild world, but a lot of people don't realize like there were women serving in the front lines, even before women were allowed to go into combat roles before Congress had approved it. And yeah, there's a lot of women's, it's hard once you do that and you try to integrate into the civilian sector, it's, it can be oh, challenging. It's going to be a hard trend. Well, it's hard for mills. Uh, we, you know, over uh, about half of our uh, team base here at Dark Rhino is ex-military. And it, it is, um, you know, what you folks have done and experienced uh, I don't think a book or a movie can describe it. it it's uh, either you have to be there to understand it, or I'll just have to say that, you know, we can barely imagine what that was like. Uh, but we're grateful that you folks were there. Yeah, absolutely. It was a, it was a great experience. Definitely, definitely made me grow up and see that we're very blessed to live where we are and have the comforts that we have and the freedom that we have. Oh, yeah. You until you're out there in the trenches, you you don't realize what a great place this nation is. Mm -hmm. So switching from that mission to now, uh, you're doing so much in the world of cybersecurity, and you're even hosting your own podcast. What would you describe your current mission as in information security? What what is your plans for this genre or our community, mm. if you will? put out as much information as possible. And, and I'm, and I've never been posed that question, but if I had to answer it, that would, in a short sentence, that would be it is I do have a YouTube channel. I do have a podcast. I, I wrote a book. The book is for entry people that are trying to break into the industry or individuals that have been in the career for maybe less than five years and still trying to find their footing and pivot. Cause you see that people enter and realize I didn't want to be a sock analyst. I want to I want to maybe be a pen tester. So I'm all about putting the information out there because, and I think a lot of this has to do with when I first got in to IT before cyber was a thing was 2008, I didn't have a mentor and there wasn't a lot of free information out there. And had there been, and had I had a mentor, I think the trajectory of my life would have been very different and I would be in a different place. I obviously would not be here having this interview with you. So everything happens for a reason. But I think that's why I do what I do now. And I help so much in the community because giving back, it will reap so many rewards for yourself. And it just makes me feel good when I see others succeed. So that's really my mission is just keep putting the content out there and really hope it impacts somebody's and life. Where, where do you see the biggest gaps in information since you're putting so much content out there? What in your mind, what three or four things do people looking to pivot to cybersecurity need info on to do well, to make that pivot go well? Yeah, I think the key is it's that entry level piece. I think that's one of the most biggest challenges for individuals that are trying to break in this space is understanding what is an entry level job there. And I have identified a lot of resources like NICE, and I can't remember what the acronym stands, stands for. It's under NIST, but N-I-C-E. They have a okay. phenomenal site that actually breaks down 
what is an actually entry level job? And then what is the feeder from that job into other positions? So I still think that is an area that needs to be communicated more because we have individuals that say, I want to be a pen tester, but you and I both know that's not an entry level job. So it's communicating right. that and then setting those real realistic expectations. And then it's also teaching individuals in this space that recruiting isn't like recruiting for an HR position or a resource management position or anything like that. You, It's almost a hidden market. So in this space, it's very unique because you have to network. You need to get out there. You have to network. Yes. I believe it's a very different market for job hiring than it is for a lot of different jobs that we're going to see. And then if there is a third thing of information that I think is critical for people to know is... I think it's important to know that this this arena is like no other jobs that I've ever or career fields I've ever been part of is that it's a community and it's a global community. Like I have so many Very friends so. that I work with all over the world. And again, it goes back to I don't think you see that in, in an HR job as much as you do in this community because we just there's just so many organizations out there and it's it's a global presence. So you're building a global family. You're absolutely right. I mean, I, just on our show, we've had so many women uh, from across the globe, uh, even as far flung places as Nigeria and Kenya, who are in cybersecurity and are making a difference. Uh, so it is very much a global community. Uh, you couldn't have said it any better. And I think we all need to learn from each other because this is one area where, uh, you know, the fundamentals will apply across the board. They they just do. Uh, now, yeah. when you did you pick up cyber while you were in the armed forces, or was this something in civilian life? And what was your first job, entry level job? Yeah, so that's what's wild is I will say that I was extremely fortunate. So when I did when I like I mentioned, I broke into IT through the military in two thousand and eight, and I was miserable, hated my life. I was doing SharePoint and help desk, and I actually wanted to get out. I tried to get out. I almost left the military. Don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, it was terrible. I'm like, I don't, I want to go as far away from IT as possible. And, and I won't go into detail, but long story short, until I broke in and I'm using air quotes in 2019, I had all these opportunities getting thrown at me to join cyber. Like, Hey, you should join the cyber. Like it was an AKO, like capture the flag, cyber games. You should work for this company. You should do this. And even my units, because I was an electronic warfare officer now, because I got out of IT, I was like, I'm going to go electronic warfare. I'm going to work on the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm going to get what I thought far away from IT, aka cyber. Didn't work. Kept getting pulled in. And then 2019, I deployed to uh, Germany for Atlantic Resolve, an operation where we okay. support NATO operations and stuff. And Long story short, they didn't have a slot for me, but they wanted to bring me because they were like, the SF look, works differently. SF will bring talent and you will fit in where you where you fit in if you if they know you have a certain talent set. So like, we're going to bring you out there as a fires warrant officer, which is like okay. those big guns. Yeah. So they're like, you're <laughs> going to be in the fires warrant officer slot, even though we know you're electronic warfare, but you're probably going to do cyber. And I'm like, what? And they're like, you know, and they literally, my sergeant major and my commander told me this. He, they're like, you have two options. You're either going to succeed or you're going to fail. So, I mean, it's going to be, and that's how SF is. They're like, go do great things. So I ended up in Europe. I'm a warrant officer. So I work very, I, I very autonomous. I don't have a team. I'm now in this active duty cell and I'm a guards member, active guards member. And then I'm like the okay. only EW. And next thing you know, I just start picking up phone calls, calling people, calling people. And I identify some of the gaps within cyber operations. And the next thing you know, fast forward, I'm doing all of these four deployed operations into Ukraine and Moldova and other areas. Wow. And I'm starting to help NATO and our host nation partners on their cyber strategy. And it literally opened up this entire world for me. And I, I was like, oh, my God, there's... This is there's so much to do in cyber. It's not just fixing printers. And that's when I realized <laughs> IT was different from cyber. Like I can't tell you how bad I wanted out of the technology space when I say that. But that's where I went. I'm going to give this a shot. And before that I was working in the Intel space a little bit because of my prior CST experience and I was afforded an amazing opportunity at a company to do cyber threat intel, which is where I started was right. not really an entry level job and I got slid right in and 
that's what I did for the next couple of years. I did cyber threat intel. It was wild. It was a great, it was a great experience. I was doing that prior to like doing this huge pivot into where I'm at now, the GRC space. But yeah, the my journey was not linear by any means. And and you uh, were a red teamer for a while. Yeah, wild. <laughs> That's see. So y you very much define the one thing we try to stop in cyber, which is lateral movement. But <laughs> but at, at the same time, I think for our listeners, it's important to hear you, you said a lot of very profound things. There is that when you're looking for that job. You know, understand entry level. You need to get in the door first. Get in the door. And then look at Jax as an example here and look at how she successfully navigated. I mean, you did that brilliantly. You you navigated from position to position and you made your own opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that's how you advance. And cyber is a place where there's so many paths. Mm -hmm. uh, that It's limitless. Uh, you just, penetration testing is a very small part mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. and, but speaking of that, let, let's look at the world of data breaches briefly. You you can't open uh, the front page of Apple News or the New York Times or something and not see some kind of a cyber story. Somebody got hacked. Something happened. What are we doing wrong? There's so much information that is out there. What is broken? Mm where resilience is not coming about where, and we continue to pay these ransoms? Yeah, that is the million dollar question because if we could figure it out, I think that we would have less breaches. But my answer to that, Jax's answer, is I think we're relying too much on technology and not putting enough emphasis on the personnel to train them up because what is the number one cause of a breach? It is human error. Hum human error. Right. And I am so glad you said that. I could, that could have, that was not designed, people, just so all the audience that's listening, that was not set up. She didn't even read the questions. I didn't. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Yeah. The number one cyber asset in a company is its people. Yeah. We need to go back to the basics. We need to start remembering what are those basics. Let's, and we need to figure out a way. And there are, like, there are, uh, platforms that are coming out to gamify cybersecurity uh, trainings because that's key. We've got to get individuals that work in the HR department that are not directly aligned like the sales team to get them to understand how to identify a phishing email and why it's important that you do not click on it. What it what it, what could actually happen and explaining that to them. Cause I think if they could understand it better instead of this fictional world that they maybe see on TV of what hackers do, I think that yeah. we could get better at reducing some of these breaches. I, I couldn't agree with you more. What, what about like, what about policies as well? Companies spending time on implementing good cyber hygiene policies and then raising awareness with their employee base beyond phishing, right? Like don't pick up a USB drive and stick it into your port from a, uh, a trade show you went to, or be careful where you're charging your cell phone or don't give your passwords to other people. Really simple things. I think policies are as effective as the leadership behind the policies that support them, but also the procedures that follow the policy. So you can have a paper all day. It says don't put anything inside like USB into your computer, but you're going to need a procedure for that. And you're probably going to need software that prevents that because let's be honest, employees are going to still try to put a USB in their computer. So we have to prevent that. So I think it's a holistic approach of not leveraging one thing too much. You can't put too much pressure and too much reliance on humans because they're going to have a human error, but we can't put too much reliance and uh, trust in our systems. Instead, we need to have a balance all the way around and a way of understanding how we can use each of these to overall create a secure environment for ourselves. But there's not one answer, unfortunately, to make this happen. So, so when we look at, you know, the world of this takes us right to the world of compliance, right? And is compliance a false God, Jax, in some way? Because we see some of the most compliant companies with the biggest data breaches in the history of data breaches. Yeah. 
Yeah, compliance isn't security. Is it? It's it is a way to measure your maturity. Obviously, you're going to be able to like cybersecurity framework. NIST has a cybersecurity framework, and you could go in. It's a zero through yep. five, and that organization might be a one or a two. And that's their maturity level. But even though you might get them to a five optimization and you know that the set of controls that you're looking at are optimized at five doesn't mean that uh, the adversary is going to be able to leverage one of those vulnerabilities that happen because Microsoft always has vulnerabilities. It doesn't mean there's not going to be a zero day it comes out. doesn't mean that one of those phishing emails aren't going to get past that spam filter and your human is still going to click on it. You could have all the controls in place. You could have multiple frameworks layered on top of each other, PCI compliant, HIPAA compliant, all these compliance. But again, it goes back to human error and it goes back to looking at it and and I love this policy compliance systems like technology to support it. And then that training piece, it's a holistic approach. You've got to have all of those, but too many people think, well, Oh, target was a great example of this. I think it was their PCI. So they had just, oh, yeah. just gotten the compliance, like check Mark gold star, you're good to go. And I think it was less than a month later, their breach happened on their POS system. Yep. That's a perfect example of how compliance does not is not security does not protect you you have got to have both you've got to look at risk holistically and you know what that was through an hvac contractor no less third party and the other thing was that yeah third party risk and their sock apparently i don't know the whole story but from and so i'm just giving the summary their sock was getting the right signals they were just ignoring yeah they were they yeah now it was coming in and they weren't recognizing it. I don't remember why. I did a, a couple of research papers on this, but I just remember one of the agencies finally had to step in because they were it, it was going on for so long and they weren't taking action that they finally had to step in and that's how they got notified. It's a wild. Wow. It's a wild story. You got it. Yeah, if anybody that's, hasn't that heard is, it, that is a wild. Yeah, it's it's crazy. But that's a great example. They were compliant, yet they still got hacked. And you know, well, you look at J.P. Morgan got hacked, mm-hmm. Marriott got hacked. Um, all those organizations, I am certain. I mean, J.P. Morgan would have an immense cybersecurity team, and meets all the compliance standards that are available out there. But we see this so often, Jax, that companies say, "Well, I'm SOC two compliant," or "I'm HIPAA compliant," mm-hmm. and and then they say, "That's my cyber program." They, they're not taking the view that your espousing should be done. And that's a problem. Mm-hmm. It is a problem. Yeah. Um, and that goes back to not it's only are a problem, we, that holistic view. Yeah. Yeah. No, not only are we relying too heavily on technology, but we're relying too heavily on being compliant, air quotes, to guide us in how secure we are. So given all these compliance standards, I had a quick question for you. We have a lot of small, medium businesses um, that that are part of our demographic. And, you know, in their world, CMMC is coming up, especially if they're doing wor- work with the federal government. So do you have any insights on NIST versus CMMC versus ISO? Is what what's a fundamental difference between these programs? Do you have any guidance mm. on that? Yeah, so I'm pretty familiar with CMMC and NIST. ISO, I know, is one of the international standards, but I will tell you, like, say, for example, NIST and ISO, they're compliance standards. And although I'm not familiar with ISO, I have looked at it. And in this space, controls are controls, and they're going to have very they're going to have similarities within those controls and those standards. So ISO, NIST is also international and it can be used by a lot of different organizations, but I know ISO is more broadly used within the commercial space where you'll see NIST more in the federal space. And so NIST and CMMC to that point, so CMMC Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification is actually based off of a NIST two, well, one particular NIST framework, NIST 171, which focuses on that CUI data, the controlled unclassified information, because just to take a step back, okay. the purpose for CMMC was to secure the supply chain, the defense industrial based supply chain. And why they're doing that, how they're doing that is through this certification process of like, okay, we're going to come in, you're going to have these lists of like, what, 108 controls or something for a level two, I think, 
regardless. Yep. It's, a, it's, it's a decent amount of controls and it's to evaluate specifically, and they already should have other frameworks, maybe NIST, you know, NIST 853. And they're going to have on top of that 171 to be like, okay, how are you securing that CUI data? How is it segmented? How, what, how is it encrypted? All of that. So they, they overlap on top of each other for that organization to be able to go after and bid on contracts. But what's really interesting, and people don't realize this, is even before the CMMC was introduced in 2019 by the DOD, organizations yeah. were self-attestation, were self attestation, self attest however you say it, saying they were self attesting, yeah. Self attesting, <laughs> thank you. They were self attesting that they were checking the box saying that we're already in compliance with this according to a DFARS rule. I think it was the 7012 rule. So they were already saying, hey, okay. our CUI data is protected. So when the CMMC came out, it's just it's taking away when you're at depending on what level two you're at, it's just taking that power away from those organizations and making them go through a third party assessment to verify indeed, are you truly like protecting your CUI data? And now we're realizing because of the, uh, the conflict or a lot of individuals, a lot of organizations are upset about the CMMC. It only tells me that these organizations were likely in a way falsifying that they were indeed Con having their CUI data protected. Oh. And and I'm probably going to get, people are probably going to be like, why is she saying oh, that? That now? should generate some comments. It'll get hate from me. But <laughs> I mean, why, if, if you were, if you were that organization, you were already doing what you were supposed to be doing. If the CMMC came out minus the money and, and, and I know that's, that's a big issue too, the money to get the third party assessment right. done. But there's a lot of complaints that, the CUI, some of their arguments are doesn't it doesn't have a good base because you should have already been doing this because you were saying you were already in compliance. So now it's just getting that certification. Is CMMC though uh, it is not a one size fits all approach, right? So the the person who's making the bolts for a particular widget the federal government is uh, using might have a different level of standard to meet than the guy that's making the embedded software. Or is that it, it, because all the other standards were kind of a one size fits all CMMC was supposed to offer flexibility. There is some within version 2.0. And now I haven't been keeping super abreast of everything within the last couple of months. And you know that CMMC sometimes moves like pond water and then it just like, it's fast and furious, all these changes. <laughs> Literally, they're like, we're not, nothing's happening crickets. And then, all right, now it's like action on. So the last I saw was 2.0 was helping create some of that definition for those organizations that may be less at risk. And where you saw that was at that level two. And that level two did like this split off where we saw you could still self-attest or you had to get the third party assessment done. And that was based on what your possible CUI data was. And it was really based around national security risk. So if you're a level three, you're obviously probably a Raytheon, you're making, you're probably supporting like military grade yeah. equipment. But that too is like, is it the guy that just has the bolts? Or maybe it's the individual that helps support making that military grade equipment. So they're going to have to get that third party. So I think that they're trying to make it where it does have better definement of who needs what level. But it's you're right. It's definitely not one a one size fit all. And I think that it's they've got an unrealistic mission. The CMMC AB to really try to figure out how are we going to put this umbrella over the entire defense industrial base. And I think they're doing the best they can with the tools that they have. Uh, uh, good, good, fair points. Um, let's see how this plays out. There's a lot of companies that are still working on that path to, uh, CMMC compliance and, um, let's see if it makes us safer. Now we are talking about unclassified data. I I'm assuming for classified information, it, it's a completely different path. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Oh, there's just to have classified information you have to be qualified to have a SCIF and you go through certain requirements to get that as a as an organization and you've got to go through a whole bunch of other qualifications. These are just for organizations that have, and it's specifically that CUI data. Because 
it might not be. It's classified, you know, it's sensitive, unclassified information. And and somebody listening will be like, well, it's unclassified information. Correct. But what if you could get the Bolts guy's information and then you could corroborate his information with the blueprint guys or gals, and then you corroborate that with the other guy that supports making the uh, military great equipment. You can put that all together and you could tell a really good story. And that's where it becomes more sensitive in nature, even though it is technically unclassified information. And you know what you just described was how Tom Clancy got the information for all his books. Good old Tom Clancy. I haven't read a Tom Clancy in a while. I need to check that out. I need to read books other than like business books and cyber books or NIST frameworks. He he did exactly pretty much (laughs) that. I mean, people always thought he had access to these classified. I'm I'm sure in the later years, maybe he did. But uh, when he wrote Hunt for Red October, that was all garnered from uh, putting the pieces together. Yeah. Putting the pieces together. Putting the pieces together. Yeah. So uh, in terms of, are, are there any resources you could point our listeners to for CMMC? Is there uh, any sites or any place you can guide them to that, that would help them on their journey? Yeah, I did a CM, I actually did a CMMC video on my YouTube channel and they can just go to Outpost Gray. Okay. G- yep. G-R-A-Y. There's a CMMC 2.0. It actually explains just what I talked about, like the splitting off of level two. It's actually in way more detail and it goes through the controls everything. I think it's super helpful. And then um, Jacob Horn is also a great resource. The guy is brilliant. Uh, Check him out. He's always in the mix with CMMC. And then the CMMC AB, I think they have like Google, they have like a fan page website that you can go to. It has really good relevant information on kind of where is the CMMC, what's happening in the space. And then I would encourage attending the monthly town halls when they have them. I haven't gone in a while but they're usually every month, the third, the third Tuesday or something. I don't know. <laughs> something like that. Oh, that. No, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll let people know in the show notes. Okay. That's, uh, that's good information yeah. people can, can have. Switching over to more on a, on a more higher level policy position. Um, do you have, what are some of your ideations on what the federal government should be adopting in terms of policies to, make a difference in information security. Yeah. So one of the areas that I'm pretty passionate about is public and private partnerships. And it's an area that I've done a lot of research in. And being that I've worked mostly, most of my career in the public sector, so in the federal sector, I see kind of, and like I mentioned about my deployment to Europe in 2019, I, I guess that was where I really witnessed firsthand how disjointed we were with our public and private partnerships. Now, there's a lot of challenges having those public-private partnerships, just as certain titles. You've got Title 10, Title 32, Title 50. And, and But what I want the listeners to understand is that the private sector owns the majority of our critical infrastructure. Yet, if there was a data breach, a big data breach, or something was to happen – we as the United States federal government, we, what I, from what I've seen, we do not have a clear path on how best to support them. Now, we saw colonial pipelines happen. That was a very low level, in my opinion, low level attack. It could have been much greater from what happened. But I believe in what. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wait, like that was hardly anything that happened. Like they were going to be up online and they even got some of their money back. So, like, that was the best situation that we could have seen as far as our in- critical infrastructure being impacted. But that was just a little bit of a taste. And it's like how, if something catastrophic was to happen in, say, for example, Texas, it has a separate grid that's separate from the other grids within the United States. What if something happened to that grid that shut down a very large portion of America? How would the public sector go and support that? It's not clearly defined. And so I think that's an area where- no, it's on. Our legit, our uh, our administration, and they are they are. I will say they are working on, it, and so did the other prior presidents before. They are trying to tackle this problem of like how is this? How are these public private partnerships going to work? And then how are we going to get these industrial leaders to be more uh, 
secure overall because that's the other challenge is they put pressure on them be more secure they and then these private entities kind of funny they push back and go cool you pay us to do that you send us the individuals you send us yeah. the professionals so it's we've got to figure this solution out because our adversaries aren't going to wait for us to figure it out and as you know our SCADA systems and all those systems are just extremely vulnerable so that's just one area of where i think uh, we need to have more of a focus you know and ted koppel wrote the book on that i don't know if you've read lights out but oh no i've heard about this book about i need that. to read this yeah, please Writing do. It down. It's, a, it's a good, it's an easy read. You could read it on your next airplane flight. Uh, I'm writing it uh, down. And, and he talks about you, how, you know, uh, critical infrastructure, uh, the grid is very vulnerable. And we've known that. I think we've all known that for a long, long time. But, you know, the it's that last part of you know, the, the private sector saying, fine, federal government, you want us to be more secure and you pay for it. I, I think this is where I the private sector has to take responsibility. Yeah. You know, it's they, they've got to step up to the plate. And I and I think it's necessary that it forces a change in mindset and that this is just my opinion, because the, the old way of uh, putting in IT systems and procuring them and instantiating them really is not the most effective way to create a cybersecurity umbrella. And that's just my opinion. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. We've, so it, hopefully, I think, if they have to pay for it. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I'd love to work more in that space, though. I'd like to get more involved at maybe com committee levels that are working in the space, uh, especially specifically within the critical infrastructure. Yeah. It's a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, real quick, uh, I want to take quick two minutes and get your opinion on Hackback. Okay. Yeah. You know, if you could explain what it is and, um, then what's your opinion? Do you think it's an effective approach? Uh, the administration is, is putting forth to curb cybercrime. Yeah. So Hackback, also known as Active Cyber Defense, is what it was originally called many years ago. Uh, through my research, I've identified that we've actually, government, federal government, we have been recommending Active Cyber Defense since 2005 with professionals in this space explaining that passive defense is not going to be effective long term, as we've seen through the rise in overall breaches and ransomware attacks. And so what Hackback is referring to is where it an organization that has been attacked will then retaliate against that organization, that nation state, the threat group that attacked their systems. Now, there are a lot of issues, challenges, we'll call them challenges associated with this. And one of the biggest ones that, and you know this, especially working in your space, and, and I know it working in red teaming and through cyber threat intel, is the word attribution, is really knowing who actually That's right. attacked me. Right. So the, the, the idea is like, yeah, that makes total sense. But the actual execution is much harder to achieve because where there's a gap in knowledge and through the research that I've identified is what if we actually do hack somebody back, but we maybe hack the wrong threat group, nation state, maybe we hack China instead of Russia for like, just an example here, what would happen? What would that retaliation look like? And we don't know what that retaliation look like. I know that there have been examples where there have been countries where they identified a hacker and their retaliation to hacking back was a missile strike. So we want to obviously oh my. avoid going from we, you, they hack us, we hack you, and now we started kinetic war. So it's, it's a very delicate spot, but what's really kind of interesting, and it hasn't come out yet, is the current leg uh, current administration has proposed as part of their national cybersecurity strategy that was supposed to come out three months ago and is still pending, is supposed to talk about this active cyber defense, aka hacking back. And I will tell you, through my research, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there was actually a law. Hang on one second. I want to find the law really quick. Hold on. I have it written down, but this was really fascinating when I found out about this law. Um, okay, here we go. 
So as we all know, we all know about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1987. That still today has a lot of influence within our space of cybersecurity. And it also influences this possible hacking back because bottom line, it says hacking another system is illegal. So there was a law that I identified that I had no idea had been presented in 2017. It was HR 3270. It was the Active Cyber Defense Certainty Act, also known as, I love this, ACDC. So ACDC was presented in 2017 to do an amendment to our very old legacy act of the CFAA to refine it to allow us to be able really? to take a defensive posture when we were when a threat actor attacked us. Now, it got turned down, it never made it. I think it got dropped in 2019 because there was too much ambiguity and there were too many individuals that were like, no, it obviously it's a sensitive topic. So, that was the first time in legislation that anything had ever been presented though on the possible use of hacking back, but until we can get our federal government on board with this, but the key here uh, is w defining what what is that going to look like and then making sure that we have that attribution. But you and I both know attribution takes a substantial amount of time. It's, and what are we going to do? We're going to they're going to hack us and then we're going to take, what, two months to get attribution to hack them back instead of just securing our environment and using those resources to secure the environment. I mean, it's a it's a catch 22. Yeah, I. I um everything you said is spot on. And then, you know, the consequences of hacking back are, unless you have dead nuts attribution, and even if you do, not all the times it, can it be predicted what that outcome is going to be. But it's certainly a very interesting concept. I mean, if you look at the sand sliding scale of cybersecurity, proactive is the right hand most side of that. So they were thinking about what the word proactive meant. Um, it's a very interesting concept and let's see where it goes. And thank you for, I didn't realize, I wasn't familiar with some of those laws myself. And now you've given me a little bit of reading to do, to go and get familiar with. Uh, Jax, I know we're just slightly over. I wanted to give the last couple of minutes for you to plug whatever it is that you'd like to plug. Let our uh, listeners know of what's going on. Please, the floor is yours. What? Let them know whatever you're thinking here. Absolutely. And thank you, Minaj and everybody for just having me on the show. I loved it. It was an honor. So if you're wanting to connect with me, hit me up on LinkedIn, JXS. You can find me there. YouTube, Outpost Gray, G-R-A-Y. If you're going to be in Colorado for the WESIS conference in March, come find me. I will be there speaking about branding. But I do want to end on this note, especially for any individuals that are out there maybe wanting to break into the industry and struggling and you're listening to this, I would tell you, don't give up. You will, you will eventually break in, but build your network. Make sure you're networking with individuals. Leverage LinkedIn as much as you can to get build up that network, but don't give up the fight because we have a talent shortage. So we do need you. So keep making that fight happen. If you have questions, reach out to me. I'm not super responsive on LinkedIn just because I'm just, I'm in school. It's a lot right now, but I've, this has been outstanding and yeah, that's all. That's all I got. Wrapping. <laughs> wrap it up yeah thank you so much Jax it's been a real honor you're fantastic and we look forward to having you back sometime in the future as you get uh, more and more involved and have new things to don't forget about us come back and let us know absolutely absolutely thanks